Okay, the next item is our Green Themes presentation by Cynthia Stump of ITC Corporation. Uh, so, welcome. yes, welcome to the township and to, we look forward to your words of wisdom. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much to the Environmental Commission and to Rick Brown for asking us to come today. My name is Cynthia Stump, and I'm a local government and community affairs area manager with ITC. And with me, I brought Luba Sitar. She's our community education and customer relations manager. And today, we're hoping to take a couple of minutes of your time, about maybe 10 minutes, to introduce ITC to you, to talk about ITC and our vegetation management practices, talk about our partnership we've had with Meridian Township in the past and going forward, and to talk about what is the right tree in the right place and why that's so important when you talk about trees and transmission lines, and hopefully have some time for question and answers. And I'm excited to hear that we have someone who is invested into the energy grid and different things into the state of Michigan and environmental experts to talk about who are people who are passionate about the same things that we are. So we really look forward to the conversation. ITC, how many of you on the commission are familiar with ITC? Oh, good. Hey, we're going about four out of seven. That's great. So more than 50%. And that is generally what we're finding. About half the population has learned more about ITC and who we are. For those of you who don't know yet, ITC is International Transmission Company, is what everybody says, what's the acronym for. ITC owns and operates the high voltage transmission lines throughout majority of Lower Peninsula, Michigan. So when you're looking across all of Michigan, you're like, what's transmission lines? If you look in the middle on your graphics in front of you, the blue box is transmission. ITC does not generate power. And we do not distribute the power to your homes or businesses. We're the super highway in between. So often, like when you go to Chicago and you get on a freeway, you pay to get on the tollway or the freeway, and you pay to get off. Same with transmission. Generation companies pay ITC to come on our transmission lines, and then they pay us to come off our transmission lines. In the state of Michigan, we start operating at 120,000 volts of power. So that's why we're not your local distribution companies. We're not the poles in front of your homes. We're only the high voltage transmission lines. A little bit about ITC. We were founded in 2003, so we're 11 years old. We're very proud to be a Michigan-based company. We are headquartered in Novi, Michigan, and we have assets all throughout the state. We have warehouses throughout the state, and we've also been fortunate to expand into other states in the Midwest. So we have service territories in Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, Illinois, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Luba and I are based out of the Novi office, and I am your area manager. So should the commission or staff or township management ever have a question in regards to ITC, I would be your first point of contact, and then from there I would connect you to the local subject matter experts. So my job is really to be the question and answer person for you as the township. For residents who have questions, in the packets that we've provided today, there are customer relations cards, and there's a phone number that residents could call, and Luba's going to discuss that, and that goes to our office, to Stephanie and Luba, to answer those questions. And the packets in front of you today is more information about ITC, supporting our conversation today, talking about who we are, what we do, and how we're invested into the communities as a whole. So many of you knew who ITC was, and hopefully you would recognize transmission assets. A little tutorial. Many people think of transmission as the large steel lattice towers. So as you can see on my left, I think it's on your left also, the larger lattice towers are often what transmission towers are considered. As we move forward and invest into the infrastructure, we are moving towards the second type of pole. It's called a monolithic steel pole. You may have seen some of those go in in the past five years on the northern part of the township. Those are the newer transmission style assets. We also have, to our west, we have what are H-frames, the wooden H-frames. Those were put in anywhere between the 40s and 70s. And you'll see those being replaced from Delhi Township down to Tompkins Township with the monolithic steel poles also. Another style of transmission tower are the older wooden monolithic steel, or wooden monopoles that are a little bit older that you'll also see being replaced in the future. 
we often like to help people understand the difference between transmission and distribution because so much for so long it was the same type of company. And the reason we're different now is so we can invest only in transmission. So in the state of Michigan, we've put in over the past 10 years between Michigan, Iowa, and Minnesota over a billion dollars of transmission investment because we only do transmission. So we're increasing the infrastructure. The stronger the transmission grid can be, the stronger your local distribution company can be to get off at those exits, off of the freeway. When we're talking about vegetation management, it's really important to understand that the poles that are in front of people's houses where the trees might be touching, those are not transmission lines. Transmission lines and trees can never mix because if we lose a transmission line going down, we're not talking just your street or your neighborhood having an outage. We're talking county, region-wide outages. And ITC is proud to say that we invest into our transmission grid so we don't have those type of outages. So we don't have, when ice storms and wind storms and things come through, we're not having the outages such as maybe a local distribution company might have because of the difference of the investment in the transmission grid that we do into the vegetation management, into the maintenance of the capital infrastructure. At this time, Luba is going to discuss the importance of ITC's vegetation management programs and why trees and transmission lines are looking for compatible vegetation species instead of incompatible species. Good evening. Thank you for having us here today. On the screen, you'll see the vegetation management crews that are out in your communities. We've been out in this township several times already. You will see us out there with all sorts of equipment. Uh, in this photo, we've got a cherry picker uh, with our crews up on it. You will also see all sizes of wood chippers out in those corridors, chipping up wood debris on the corridors. You will see ITC along the sides of the truck to recognize our, our independent contractors that are working with ITC. You will also see us in your communities several times a year. We do helicopter patrols twice a year along the transmission assets. So we don't want you to be alarmed if you see helicopters hovering over those transmission lines. They are inspecting the lines for issues. We also are on the ground within your communities. Once a year we do a foot patrol down the corridors to visually check for vegetation maintenance issues. We do a good job at ITC in communicating with the township. When we are working within your community, we will often, or we will, door tag within your community. On the right side of the screen, you will see a typical door tag that we leave with a landowner, where we will put our phone number for contacting us, our forester's name that's working in the area, who will be our local expert on the vegetation maintenance that's being done at that location. So if landowners have questions, they have someone who is um, personally knowledgeable about that section of the corridor that they can contact and discuss any issues they might have. We also have the customer line on that that will come to Novi and be answered by Stephanie or myself to address any concerns that we could help with. On our website, you will also find this diagram on the left side of the screen, which is some suggestions for compatible vegetation on a corridor. Now, this isn't by any means the only vegetation that can grow on a corridor, but it's suggestions for suitable plant material to plant if you have transmission assets near your, your land. And you will find that on your website. A lot of times your residents will be puzzled about what can they plant if we don't want woody vegetation if we don't want trees on the corridor. These are some suggestions to use. In ITC, we do a strong partnership with communities to educate about the right tree, right place within a community. We often do sponsorships within communities, and we've done so with Meridian Township. And we like communities to use that for various purposes within it, uh, community to support uh, strong community recreation, for park amenities, for trails, for replacing trees within your parks that might be ravaged by disease, uh, to, to diversify the urban, uh, to diversify the tree canopy within a township so that you have a healthier overall community. As Luba said, ITC's investment into vegetation management is similar along the ITC lines of ITC's investment into capital, 
vegetation management, and long-term partnership. We strongly believe by investing in the communities, we create partners to help residents understand ITC and who we are and what we do, because we are often in your communities. They will see our trucks, as Luba said. We might be doing pole replacements one by one. We might be doing vegetation management. We might be doing entire pole replacement of the line, similar from Delhi Township to Tompkins Township. We're always in the community. We're very proud to give back. We've worked with Meridian Township for the past year. You guys have a great staff in your community economic development group and your township management. We've really been very fortunate to have people who are responsive to our questions and work to find solutions. So it's been a great partnership. We hope the most recent sponsorship. We look forward to seeing how that's utilized and different things. And you have a lot of great opportunities coming with your nature preserves and your park. So we look forward to that, and we'd love to answer any questions that you might have for us. Well, I have a comment. I wanted to thank you for the contribution to the township that you, your company gave us. Um, but I do have some questions. Sure. Um, the lattice towers, now, are, are you phasing those out eventually? I don't know that they, you know, they fall apart or anything, but are you getting, you're not going to put up new ones, or are you? It depends. So our engineers, we have a... Lots of design engineers in-house. Many of the new designs are that monolithic steel pole. The lattice towers, they are still used for corner structures. When the line turns, you'll see that used. Oh. But primarily, the newer designs, you'll see this second pole, the monolithic steel pole. And the poles, there's a different engineering calculation as to when the towers are replaced or the poles are replaced. And it, to when the line, the infrastructure needs to be increased. And so there is a program throughout... That, that occurs. Okay. There, so the lattice is a little bit stronger, like you say, for corners and so on. You'll still see lattice towers for corner structures, absolutely, yes. For in the new, and that's what you're going to put in. You're putting in the mono, what do you call it, mono? mono the monopoles, monolithic monopoles. steel poles. Monos. Uh, for this, this replacement from, would you say, DeWitt to? Delhi, Delhi. Township Delhi. to Tompkins Township. Okay. And you'll be using the lattice for corners. Yes. And, and, okay. The other question, I'm just... I don't know how relevant this is at anything, but the the corridors that you maintain, do, does the company own those or are those easements or a combination? I mean, do you actually own the property or are they easements? It is a combination. It depends on what side of the state we're on primarily. In this service territory, when ITC acquired the transmission assets from Consumers Energy, which at the time was METSI, Michigan Electric Transmission Company, consumers maintained the rights to own the property underneath if Consumers Energy had always owned it. So in Meridian Township from Doby to Okemos, north of Jolly, that east and west corridor, that is a fee-owned Consumers Energy parcel. So where Consumers Energy owns it in fee, ITC has the easements on those parcels, and we actually own the transmission assets, the towers themselves, but the property and the taxpayer on record would still be consumer's energy. So do you have to pay them rent for use of their easement? <laughs> you know, and re when the transaction happened, there was agreements that occurred. I'm not sure of the end of specific details, but as part of the transaction, there were costs associated with that. If there has always been an easement, let's say in the 1940s when the transmission lines were put in, consumer's energy got an easement from landowner A, that easement would have transferred to ITC, and we would still only have an easement. So some parcels are fee-owned, some are easement-owned. And then in some parts of the footprint as well, not specifically in Meridian Township, if ITC creates a new substation or if we're creating new parcels, then it could also possibly be owned by International Transmission Company. Okay. All right, thanks. Do these various poles that you're showing here on, on, the, on the slide... I'm under the impression that some of them are 360 and others are 120. And can you just quickly sure. show the voltage that goes through those? Yes, I can talk. I can't show you, but yes, <laughs> I'd love to demonstrate. We have different <coughs> voltage classes in the state of Michigan that ITC owns and operates. We start at the minimum of 120,000 volts. In the state of Michigan, that's what defines anything over 100,000 volts is defined as transmission. So we have 120,000 volts. Typically, that's going to be your wooden monopoles. It could be the H-frames. It could be the monolithic steel poles. Or it could be a lattice tower, 120 kV. Oh. In Meridian Township, it's 138,000 volts, or 138 kV. And that is what we have. You have all, for sure, the first one, two, three. I'm not sure if the smaller wooden monopole, if you have in Meridian Township... 
On the northern side. Road in that area, I believe. Okay. Yes. Heartland or something yeah, like that. Oakland, that, that was yeah. Wetland yeah. Permit. yeah, right, yes. yeah. So, Those used to be wood and they were replaced with steel. Yes, okay, and that's 138,000 volts. We also have a 230,000 volt, not in Meridian Township, but in the state of Michigan. Those can operate, I've seen them on the two higher ones. And remember, I'm not a design engineer or civil engineer, but the voltages, and then you have 345,000 volt lines, which I have known on the two, the lattice towers and the monolithic steel poles. There possibly might have been some on the H frames. I would have to have our engineers do a calculation to tell you what percentage. But 345 kV is the highest voltage that in the state of Michigan we own and operate. Neat. Mm -hmm. Oh, a couple things. Go ahead. Um, with the higher voltage, does that provide uh, for longer travel of the energy? Meaning if it's at a very high voltage, you can send it a really long way? So with transmission as a whole, transmission is an interconnected, it's your loop, it's your grid. So with different voltages are based upon what the needs of the load centers are. So when engineers do a calculation, they determine what is the load need. So if they're it's coming out of a power plant, it's going to come out at 345,000 volts. And then that goes to a local substation, and that can convert down to the voltages where that need is based, based upon distribution requirements as well as transmission. Generally, transmission does go longer distances, similar to a freeway. That is why. In regards to what higher voltage goes to lower voltage, I don't have the specific calculations, but transmission can go longer distances, and that is why you have longer distances between substations and different things as well. How wide are the corridors? The corridors vary depending on voltages. Um, they can go anywhere from 150 feet at 120,000 volts up to 300 plus feet for 365,000 volts. Okay, 150 to 300 approximately, did you yes, say? Yes, and some are higher than 300 feet. We do have oh. some over up to 400. Okay, feet. and could you explain again what the policy is with respect to vegetation? I know obviously you're clearing it. Do you have an active program to plant certain types of things in the corridors? You, apparently, you permit uh, residents or the township to plant certain things within certain constraints, but uh, how does that work? In our corridors, and specifically in Meridian Township, we are clearing from 80 foot on either side of the, the corridor, incompatible vegetation within that corridor. We do not encourage any sort of plantings in the corridor, but if it, the plantings are there, it has to be compatible shrubbery, low shrubbery or grasses. Um, thank you. Is the concept of uh, neighborhood gardening allowed in these corridors, that type of thing? Well, when there's a corridor in this particular community, we don't own the land. We have an easement on the land, so any permission for that would come from consumers' energy. Okay. In general, community gardens are low growing and they are compatible. It just comes down to who owns the property. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a landowner and I own the property and there's transmission lines going over it and I want to have a garden, that is typically not a concern as long as our crews can still get access. If it's owned by consumers, that is where you just have to ask for permission for a license. Okay, thank you. Am I correct that in some areas of the country there's actually 750? 765. 765. Yes. In Michigan, there aren't any. Of no, we those? go up to three hundred and forty-five thousand volts. It, I said, it, even our you don't own all the hot transmission in the state. Are there's other transmission companies, or you do you do it all. We majority of Lower Peninsula, Michigan, where you have local co-ops and local muni-owned oh, power. We have. do not own the transmission lines, and on the northern and the upper peninsula, we do not. So if you look and in your packet, there's even a closer up map. But if you can see the dark blue oh, right. yeah. and light blue, if, it, if the transmission was ever owned by DTE Energy or Consumers Energy, I can tell you that ITC now owns the transmission lines in that area. If it's a local co-op or muni, there are interconnection agreements. Okay, thanks. Right. Do you agree uh, or permit trails in the corridors? Uh, what's your kind of policy on trails? I'm also the trail specialist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And the reason I'm a trail specialist is I recently came from the Department of Natural Resources, where I spent 27 years with state parks. Mm. Uh, so very familiar with trails. And yes, we do permit trails uh, with a licensing agreement under certain conditions on our corridors. And that's where, for this area, you'd, you'd reach out to Consumers Energy first, and then Consumers Energy would do their review process, and then they would forward it to ITC to do a review process as well. And we can work with Rick afterwards if you need those contacts at Consumers and then to get to us. Is there a map of some sort that uh, documents who owns what right away and, you know, essentially who to talk to? Do you, the, you probably map, have that. The map, we had this conversation earlier, that <coughs> you cannot publish the map because of Homeland Security concerns. Right. Yeah. I can, oh, boy. Right. Okay. Because it's transmission lines and it shows the substations, um, I can work with Rick, and we can, he, we can give you a copy. But generally, we own from Lake Lansing. There's transmission lines west of Doby Road down to Jolly. Then we go west, north of Jolly. We run parallel to Jolly yeah. to the railroad. Okay. And so, but when I say we own, we own the transmission assets. The actual fee property owner, the best place to look is a plat book or a plot map to see. And then where you see consumers' energy in a long, contiguous, thin corridor, <laughs> That's where you know they're the transmission lines. Yes. And your county website is a, is a phenomenal resource. Right. right. So it's a great, where I was able to quickly find. No, I guess, I, I mean, the part that I was sort of curious about is, uh, you know, how easy is it to figure out for a given, let's say, you know, I'm riding my bike along and I say, boy, it'd really be nice to have a trail there, uh, you know, fig just figuring out who to talk to, basically. Is, uh, uh, yes, because this is the opposite of land preservation land, which well, we were sort of discussing, you know. Plat maps and prop, not plat maps, but maps, Sidwell maps from the counties would have all the property yeah. owners on it, and you could see those linear routes along there easily. Yeah. And Luba's card and my card are in your packets, and yeah. you could call us afterwards. And Luba will sit down with you and say, this is where we are. And then, like I said, you would start with Consumers Energy and Meridian Township, and they would forward it to us. But... We can quickly pull up a separate map and just say, you know, we're from here to here, but that still won't tell us who owns it, mm -hmm. and that's where you would want to work with Rick and the planning department to determine ownership, because even though the transmission assets, assets are there, does not mean that it's owned by the, tra the transmission company or the utility it might only have an easement. One of the township's ordinances related to wireless communication recommends co-locating on other existing structures versus always need to put up new poles. I've seen w wireless communications on top of transmission towers. Does that all, do they work fairly well there? And B, do they also work on the monolithic steel ones? Because the ones I see tend to be the traditional high-tension lattice ones, right? In regards to how well they work, I, I can't testify to that. I know there have been arrangements where cell phone towers have been allowed to be part of the transmission towers. You don't see that as much anymore. Mm -hmm. If that is something that you have a cell phone provider, they have often worked with our ITC real estate to determine that and consumers energy real estate, but I don't know how well it works in regards to that. In regards to does it work with a monolithic steel pole, I would have to go back and ask real estate and design engineering. Because I've seen them on top of the the lattice ones, but I don't think I've seen them on the monolithic steel pole ones, and it may just be how close the proximity of the lines to the antenna. And, and I can ask. I can take that back and ask. I just don't know. Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, we, we haven't had any inquiries in that regard recently, but it was one of the things. You, you see them along 275 down there yes. near Detroit and other, and other places along transmission lines. And there was a lines. large boom for a while with that. Okay. We currently are not doing that as much. Okay. And is IT, you mentioned there are other transmission companies. Are they independent like ITC, or are they divisions of power companies? We are the only independent transmission company in the United States. That's what meaning, I thought. I didn't think there were. I didn't, don't remember hearing of any others. Yes. So as an independent transmission company, what that means is our dollars do not come from a, what's a vertically integrated utility. So someone who creates power or someone who distributes it and owns transmission is considered vertical. Those of us who are, which is ITC, that only own transmission, we're completely independent. So our board of directors have no affiliation. So they're not going to benefit by investing in Generation A. So we're non-discriminatory. Non so whether it be solar, wind, nuclear, coal, 
hydro, any of that source of generation can connect to transmission lines. And same with distribution. Any type of distribution company can take it from our transmission line. So as an independent operator, we're able to invest and make the best decision for the transmission grid only. So with the new wind farms in the thumb and up in <coughs> places like uh, Isabella County and places like that, are you building whole new transmission connections to those to link those to the grid? We are. Okay. With the wind development that went into the Thumb area, ITC has built a double circuit 345,000 volt line for over 100 miles to harvest that wind that was being created by all the wind generation and take it to the load centers. And then also in Gratiot County and different counties. Gratiot so, County, that's okay. I was yes. thinking Isabella, but yeah, you're right. Okay. So, so any type of generation can connect, and it's worked through a whole out through an engineering process where it's determined, you know, when the when the loads are coming on and where they're going to be and then what transmission needs to be invested to get that out. Okay. Thank you. Uh, with the large amount of resources involved in, in building these big towers of steel, it, does ITC consider uh, reclaimed steel, uh, reusing steel that has been used in a, had a previous life, in other words, Recycled. As opposed to virgin steel, if you will. You know, I don't know. I know we have specific manufacturers that we have agreements with. I don't know in regards to what they do. I can take that back and ask our design engineers and ask them and ask our manufacturers, but I don't have that answer today. Okay. But I can, if you want me to communicate through Rick, I can do that or through your chair. Yeah, that, that would be oh, great. Oh, what an interesting question. Yes. Mm. Um, yeah, many, uh, I think when consumers owned some of the transmission lines, there were issues involving so-called stray voltage. Uh, I, I think that was long before you took over. What? I'm not even sure what stray voltage is. I have an idea, but uh, and I know there was some litigation over that. But is there something that ITC is doing to avoid that issue? And supposedly it was getting into the ground or animals were supposedly affected, at least those were the allegations. Right. I don't know the facts, but so I'm curious about that. Sure. And my understanding, once again, not an electrical engineer, but I will give you the Normal. community affairs. <laughs> stray voltage is a distribution concern. Because of transmission at the voltage that we operate, stray voltage is not a concern. Okay. And I can give you specific engineering statistics as to why. But in general, it's, it's not a transmission issue because of the different voltages. Okay. I thought it was under the high voltage ones, but then I don't know the details. And I, I believe I know which case was pretty public. So we, and we can talk. But it's, it is the distribution side of the stray voltage versus the transmission. Okay. okay. And you said load center. You said you bring the, the, the wind farm to the load center. What is a load center? Thank you. Yes. I forget if I use the technical terminology. <laughs> As you know, energy uses have increased. So, you know, let's say back in the 40s, people maybe had one television, if any. As we continue to grow each decade, we have, you know, two televisions, three televisions, laptops, refrigerators, air conditioning. All of that creates energy needs, which creates a demand for a load, a load of power. So a load center is where you have the most need for power, whether that be because of industrial, manufacturing, residential, where... The most power is being utilized is your load centers. So where your wind farms are being built are often in the more rural settings where it's not homes back-to-back, -back, where it's not large industrial, where it's not large manufacturing customers. So the wind is being generated in areas where the population is not at. So you have to get that wind from those areas to the settings that need it most. So there's wind farms being placed all throughout not only Michigan, but Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas, and Oklahoma. So ITC is investing into the transmission grid to help get that wind to the larger areas that do need it. And the best part about being the transmission grid is we're interstate commerce. You're not only servicing Michigan, you're servicing the different states based upon where those load centers are. And you need to explain that. Oh, more. Well, the, the fact that energy is not stored, so if there right. is a wind farm producing excess energy and Michigan does not need it, it can be transferred on that grid somewhere that does have a higher demand right at that moment to use, and it's not just wasted. But that does bring up a couple of technical things. So first of all, from a, from a sort of uh, investment point of view, Presumably, that means that opportunities for you are springing up as you know, as more investment in wind and solar, those types of things are being made. Does that mean that your company 
is considering or, or in fact has any diversification sort of moving in the direction of, of a new generation? Roles? We are only transmission. It's pure and transmission. If you talk to our executive team and our board, we will always be transmission. When we were founded 10 years ago as a transmission company, it was with great pride that we would only do transmission. So while there are other, other opportunities, there's a lot of opportunities for transmission. And historically, the investment in transmission was about 8 to $10 million a year. We put in over $100 million a year in transmission to strengthen that grid. So there's a lot of underinvestment historically in transmission. So there's transmission opportunities. And that's why we've been able to expand from starting off in just the DTE energy footprint in Michigan to now into Iowa and Minnesota and Missouri and Illinois and Kansas and Oklahoma because of that need. So coming back to the, uh, the issue of high voltage and so forth, um, first of all, um, why do you have to have different uh, corridor widths for different voltages? I mean, presumably these wires are so high in the air that nobody's, uh, you know, about to touch them. Uh, and so why does the corridor have to be wider when the voltage is higher? Sure. Next time I'm bringing an engineer with me. <laughs> Just be real close. So when you design a transmission cord exit, it's not the distribution voltage where you can be right in front of your home where you can go out like, like and touch it. The voltage, you, there are national electric safety codes that you have to follow when you're doing You can't touch distribution wires. Right. But, 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 be I'm well aware yes. so, <laughs> Thank you. Don't, <laughs> do not touch any power lines. Yes. No touching of power Only lines. Only when I'm feeling kind of dead. <laughs> The National Electric Safety Code and then IEEE has different standards for transmission lines. So the higher the voltage is, the more width you need because the concern of things falling into the transmission line. So when you have a corridor and you build a transmission line, let's say we're building the monolithic steel pole. When you're putting that up, we know that if you have a tree from 75 to 100 feet, depending on the voltage that would fall in, it could cause an outage on that line. So it's looking about what could grow up into it, whether it be you don't want homes right next to it because of the way that energy can jump. You also have, it's not straight voltage, but it's called arcing yeah. that goes over. You have the contact of equipment when our crews have to get in there. So engineering designs have determined the safest voltages and the safest distances from those voltages. And that's nationwide. That's not an ITC thing. That is an industry standard that has to be followed. Okay. So the other question was, uh, am I correct in still believing that you guys are running at 60 hertz? Or is it, uh, so, I mean, this is AC current, right? Uh, alternating current. I don't know. I, I know that what current, but I don't know what 60 megahertz. I'm sorry, I didn't 60 bring the 60 hertz. Is the normal, just the, you know, 60 cycles per second is the normal frequency of household current. And, and I think it's transmis transmission retains that frequency, but I'm not sure. I would have to take that back. I have to She's say it's the first time I've ever been asked that question. Yeah. That's what, I've been doing this for 10 years, and that's the first time I've gotten that question and the steel question. So, Well, because it was relevant to... The chair has perplexed with his questions. <laughs> I was the environmental green team. I brought our environmental packet. I was a vegetation expert. I'm sorry. I did not come with my engineering experts. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. I, yes. I was encouraged to hear that you actually had enough faith in the wind generation to invest yeah, money. I agree. To yes. transport that power. I'm curious to know how much you're getting. I mean, is there some way you measure it and... So, you mean you in know, terms of the, kilowatts know, or money? Say, good megawatt. Oh. Right, how many megawatts are coming from yeah, wind? Yeah, yeah. I can get that data for you. I don't have that today, but I know in our transmission center, like if we wanted to do a tour, I could offer the Environmental Commission, if you would like to do a tour, we can set up time to do a tour to come into ITC's control room and from the viewing area, we can see that. You can actually see the loads the megawatts that are coming from wind. Different corridors that you use and to do. sources. Yeah, but are, so are those towers that you put in, are they exclusively transmitting uh, some of the wind at some points? They were... Wind power? Or wind? They're not only for wind. So whether it's being created by a coal power plant or nuclear or solar, it's all generated. Oh. It's transmitted through the lines. Its generation can come onto transmission. They were invested. The transmission investment was because of all the wind, because you can create all that wind, but it wasn't going to go anywhere without right. the transmission no. investment. So, but can we say at one time how much wind or how much nuclear? I don't know that answer. I know they can tell you how much wind is going through the system, but I don't know if they could say what percentage on what line. 
No big batteries yet. No big batteries yet. <laughs> yeah, could you uh, uh, kind of give us some idea about the impact on birds? In regards to safety next to the transmission lines? Uh, yeah, I mean, are there fatalities? Uh, is anything done to kind of minimize fatalities? Uh, you mean like the lines? Okay, I just wanted, lines, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to give Luba the answer if she wanted to. I know in the Great Plains region, which is in our Kansas and Oklahoma area, there have been questions and concerns, and there have been looked at different options in regards to transmission lines. On a typical answer, my answer would be, there aren't an everyday concern. Do I know of any bird that has flown into the transmission line? I personally don't, but I know like if there is an eagle's nest, we work very closely to make sure we don't disturb an eagle's nest when doing vegetation <coughs> management or capital. When we are designing the transmission line, I don't know of a specific thing that we, our engineers have to do, but I can ask them. But from a base level, when I present a new project to a community, I'm not discussing yeah. bird diverters or anything like that. I know in the Great Plain region, as questions have come up, in regards to birds, but I don't have the specific answer today. Probably because the Great Plains are on the central highway, the Great Central Migration Flyway, mm -hmm. and that's probably why you hear those questions. Because there's a lot of, like up in the Dakotas, there's a lot of small lakes where uh, you know birds will nest and and or wading birds and stuff like right. that will live. I can proudly say that because of our vegetation management activities and our capital improvements, we have partnered with Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever. National Wild Turkey Federation, a lot of the organizations that are for conservation of specific migratory birds or avian different things, we're part of the Electric Avian Institute. I, it's, I'm personally not the representative, but we are invested into that type of institute and research. We, we are learning more about it. So we have representatives. Unfortunately, I just didn't bring them today. But I can get back to you. Um, along those lines, I, I am curious to get an understanding of if ITC, uh, when crossing uh, public lands, uh, let's say federal lands, BLM, Forest Service, state, do you have any, any agreements or uh, coordinations as far as wildlife habitat corridors? Do you make any manipulations in your plans <laughs> to accommodate? I know. <laughs> okay. Well, in particular, working with the state parks of Michigan, ITC assets to go through the state parks. And in those instances, the state parks actually owned the land that the assets were running across. And they would always communicate well with us to discuss any impacts to the habitats that the, the capital improvements or the vegetation management was going to affect. So they were very careful about that. And we were very careful to watch them. So. In regards to Bureau of Land Management, different things, depending on what the different service territory is, we work very closely with any state, federal, local agency that has the partnership. Whether it means they own it or we own it, we always try to work together. And in the Midwest, we absolutely have strong partnerships, as well as in the Great Plains, as well as in Michigan. In your packet, we have an environmental brochure that highlights our different things. You mentioned wildlife habitat. We actually are Wildlife Habitat Council certified on I think now five of our transmission corridors as well as our headquarters because of our investment into the biodiversity of the corridors we understand that they are more than just a power corridor than more than just transmission lines so we are certified through the Huron Clinton Metro Parks on their on their property through the National Wildlife Habitat Council so when we've done on our property it's been amazing on page two, you can actually see our headquarters. I'm wondering which one you're um, looking at. In their packets, it's the back brochure, yes. These are also available online for those of you watching on TV. Here's a link you can click online. It's, it's the back when we, oh, side yes. Thank you. We are very proud of all of our environmental investments that we've done from our certifications to our employee green team to the different projects that we have done throughout the area too. There's a whole section on renewable energy, to different habitat training. So there's a lot of different great things that we have done. We are, because of our vegetation management practices and how we look at it holistically from a large approach, we are tree line certified through the National Arbor Day Foundation in Michigan, in Iowa, and Minnesota. We work really hard to make sure we're working with the communities in different aspects of that, making sure our crews have the training, making sure the certifications are there. 
We also partner with, like I said, the federal agencies, the state agencies, and all of that is highlighted in the packet. And if you have different opportunities, you know, please let us know if there's something that, you know, like I said, I openly admit I don't know everything. So these are great questions that I can take back and find out and share with you. If it's not, and I said, and most of this is, almost all of it is available electronically. So if you lose your packet, you can just go to our itcholdings.com and you can find that information on the website. I'm intrigued that our staff person, Rick, used a term that I thought was, was long gone. It's the one that I used to know, the high tension towers. I always knew them as high tension, not, not high voltage, just they were high tension. Yeah. That's not what I wanted to mention, though. That you're old? <laughs> <laughs> He's as old as I am, obviously, <laughs> if he can use the terms. Uh, and nowadays it's I was, high stress. I was under the impression that somehow or other, well, maybe, maybe you can tell me, was this separation of generation, transmission, and distribution, was that a decision that, that the major power companies came to? I was under the impression that there was some federal legislation that said, you can't do them all. There was legislation and there were incentives. And in 1999 is when that started, that vertically integrated utilities were incentivized to deregulate the different things. And in Michigan, they supported deregulation, and that is where transmission became separate. Mm -hmm. Across the country, you will see some vertically integrated have transmission as a separate subsidiary, and that's where the independence question came up. We are completely independent versus being owned and operated still by others. But there, were, there was leg legislation, and there were incentives. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the technical. Um, <laughs> You're really trying to make sure you quiz me. No, no, but one of the conventional uh, bits of wisdom about electric power generation and distribution is that um, in terms of efficiency, uh, there are great losses in transmission uh, overall. Uh, I mean, in the process of getting it from where it's generated, you know, you have to ask, okay, I've got a lump of coal and I'm going to burn it. I know what its energy content is. How much uh, of that energy becomes electrical energy when I burn it in the turbines, etc.? And then uh, in conversion to uh, up conversion to high voltage, what are the uh, efficiencies of those steps, et cetera? And and uh, depending on whose literature you read, you know, some people say, oh, it's only a few percent, and some people say it's 50 percent of all the power that's generated. And so I was wondering, first of all, is there a way in which uh, ITC um, evaluates that? Com your component of that loss equation, and are there things that are that practices, for example, um, I don't know, choices of different insulation, wire strategies. I, I don't know enough techno technological questions to ask, but I'm just curious how much can you um, actually assist, or or the other way around, uh, affect anyway the efficiency of the power distribution process. Oh, if we had engineers here, they'd be loving it. <laughs> I know the Next losses on transmission lines are minimal. I don't know a percentage, and I don't know. Right. I know when the design occurs that things, all different factors are looked at, but I don't know what percentages are losses or not, or different things. I can ask in regards to, for this line in particular, but in general, transmission line losses are very minimal compared to what historically people had thought. Okay, but transmission lines are very, very long, so all, all you need is a tiny little feather, you know, mm. bit uh, per mile, and, and it still matters. I, I was just sort of curious about how much that is part of the conversation, because, of course, the efficiency of, of energy use is a tremendous component in, or inefficiency, in the consequences of, uh, for example, how much coal we burn, how much mercury we admit, uh, emit to the atmosphere, et cetera. And so, uh, if you know, if ITC can can say, look, we're you know we're two percent more efficient than any other transmission, or we're using the the latest and greatest technology, that's a, that's definitely something we want to be able to recognize. Right, and the terminology that we often use on the same context of what you're talking about is reliability, and what reliability we offer, and why transmission lines and the investment that we have made offers a more reliable transmission grid because when you have manufacturing companies that even go out for one to two seconds, that could be a multi-million dollar decision. 
And so what we talk about is the investment, how we have increased the reliability of the transmission grid so that doesn't occur, and how the redundancy and the reliability of the system happens so when something does happen, it doesn't impact the load centers or the different areas because of that. I said in regards to losses, I can look, but under on the other brochure, which is also available online, it talks about ITC and our operational excellence and the reliability and performance. And the one that says super highway? Yes. So that might, and if you look under our website, under itcholdings.com, we have a whole group that talks about stakeholders and service reliability that might also, also answer that question. I said, I'll take it back and ask our engineers about losses specifically. But that might give you more context as to what we're looking at when we invest into the transmission infrastructure. Okay, very, very interesting. Thank, thank you very much. Thank yeah, thank well, you. Well, we really appreciate your time and your questions. Thank you so much. We love that you were so involved. <laughs> Uh, it's encouraging to me to hear that. So you were working with DNR, Luba? Yes. Uh, and and uh, and did ITC come and court you away from D the state, or or uh, did you decide that they, they needed did. somebody who was responsible to look after them? <laughs> they did court me, but uh, I loved working for the state park system. I was a district manager for the state park system and trails and boating access sites for southeastern Michigan. Oh, okay. So I have a lot of uh, experience with recreational assets. But so you're also, yeah, well aware of, you know, when people talk about any kind of extended structure, whether it's a railroad, a, a, ro a highway, uh, a, an open corridor that, you, you know, is more or less grassy, you know, these things are considered to create wildlife islands and so forth. So I'm sure that you... In the DNR, we're very concerned with the loss of prairie habitat. So right. I was kind of eavesdropping when you were talking <clears throat> about your preserve. Um, right. You know, we're happy to see those those pieces of land set aside to preserve habitats in across in and across the state. Um, but do you guys try to build? I don't know, a corridor like a little bushy bushy corridor. I mean, some creatures just don't move around in open in the open. Uh, they they like a little cover right. um, to uh, protect themselves. Uh, but and certainly prairie habitats are preferred corridor, um, a preferred type corridor because it is beneficial to the environment across the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they say? We have a hundred, had 140 million acres of prairie, and we now have less than 4% of that now, so about 5 million acres left, and that's fractured habitat. Right. And the transmission corridors are used as animal migratory patterns. We do find that through clearing of the corridors, when we took over the system 10 years ago, many of the trees were growing directly up underneath the transmission lines and growing over into. And as we began to clear underneath the transmission lines, you start to see that native seed bed come back. And we have actually found, and this is where we got Wildlife Habitat Council certified, is that you do have animals that who weren't coming around before because it was so overgrown and so swampy that when you open it up, it allows different light, it allows different vegetation that brings back your turtles and brings back your turkeys and things that weren't there. And then when we do remove the trees on the larger corridors in the more rural corridors, we call it wind row. So when you take the trees down, you leave them for natural habitat. So you do have your smaller animals, your bunnies and your, you know, fluffy things. And some people don't like some of the items. So, but you know, but you do have animals that do burrow in those long wooden wind rows that are left. And we do find the deer. And we do find the different animals that previously would not have been able to cross or go through that corridor. And what we're finding, I know on the southeastern side, we work with the International Wildlife Refuge Alliance to do different repairs along their corridors with herbicides and different activities that we have found success in the transmission <coughs> corridors that help bring animals that haven't been there, whether it be the birds or, you know, the four-legged friends, they're able to use our corridors. And it's been great because we have, we work with biologists to document that, what are the native seed beds and what's coming back, which would have never been there five years ago. And we, that's a whole different presentation, but we actually do a lot of great stuff where we show the stages of, you know, stage one where it's overgrown and woody and invasive, you can't tell. Stage two, we come through to removals. Stage three, we come through and do herbicides. And then stage four, you have this natural prairie. You have, whether it's defined as prairie technically versus, you know, those of us who look at it and say, oh, it's pretty grasses and different colors, you have that. And if you actually go through your corridor between Dobie and Okemos on Jolly, 
you'll see how that has even transformed over the past couple of years with ITC working in that corridor. You start to see that different, that look that you're going to find where you originally had that woody and invasive. You have more of your natives returning and different things that are low-growing and compatible. I the transmission. That card. Yeah, it is pretty nice, actually. It is. So it's, it's getting there. And our corridors as a whole are getting there because we've been much more proactive with maintaining the vegetation management that you'll find that throughout the state, you'll see areas, like if you ever travel to the Creek Metro Park, you'll see, like, if you're like, wow, this was a transmission line, I didn't even know it was here. Right. And now you can see that open habitat, and you'll see the different wildlife. It's really amazing, and the pictures have been awesome to look. Except on our website, we have the different things in that environmental brochure. And if you ever go to the Wildlife Habitat Council <laughs> conversations, we were just, like I said, there's different PowerPoints we've done and different things. Am I right, though, in thinking that community members mow sort of a section of that if I remember right there's sort of a path a kind of an informal path there uh, it is definitely an informal unlicensed path oh. so <laughs> I didn't say anything we uh, right so we encourage those who are mowing that to look forward to getting a license with consumers energy uh -huh. I know nothing I you know nothing I, I heard just nothing, rode my but, bike down no, there one we, day I Which and we are cool. aware that that is a path that I know Rick has talked about before but for those that are mowing, if just work with Consumers Energy to work on getting a license would be best okay. for that area. All right. Any other questions? No bison have returned to the prairies yet, <laughs> have they? That would be <coughs> very would interesting be to see as a transmission, you know, truck goes driving down there. <laughs> so, well, thank you again so much. If you have follow-up questions, please feel free to email myself or Luba or email Rick. And, Rick, you know, you're welcome to call us. We're you know, in the office Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. We'd love to have you come out and do a tour. Let us know if there are specific questions. And then for residents that have questions, please have them call the customer line. It's 877-ITC-ITC9. We're not a large call center. Stephanie answers it Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Uh -huh. And if Stephanie's off, they talk to Luba. And if Luba's off, they'll talk to me. So you've now met two-thirds of anybody that might answer the phone So at ITC. So thank you again so much for your time. Enjoy your evening. Thank you very thank much. You. And with your permission, we'd like to take off. Oh. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, you guys still have a bit of a drive.